This morning's scripture is taken from the book of John, chapter 9, verses 1 through 11 and 35 through 38. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked him, Is this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, No, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes open? they demanded. He replied, The man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash, so I went and washed and then I could see. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? the man asked. Tell me, so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. The word of the Lord. Children are dismissed if they'd like to head out to Children's Church. You know, I re- received my call to ministry, this has been, been 20 years ago. And uh, I remember, so I was 17, and I was sitting in my church, and I, I knew that the Lord had called me to the, the pastorate. And I was scared of lots of things. Uh, I don't really care for public speaking, so that was not really my favorite thing. But what most scared me was, for the life of me, I couldn't figure out how did they do it. Like, how did preachers get in the pulpit and in my home church pontificate for 45 solid minutes about one thing, right? Because all I could think was, okay, okay, Jesus healed the man. All you have to do is say, Jesus healed the man. What do you do for the next 45 solid minutes? Well, two Sundays ago, one of you met me in the lobby, and I think without any irony, came up to me, grabbed my hand, and said, Pastor, how do you do it? You went 30 minutes and you only talked about one sentence. Guess what that means? 20 years later, I've arrived and I can do it. Thank you, thank you. This is my subtle way of saying, I'm going to do it again. (laughs) Today, we're going to look at just this verse, really just this one sentence that Jesus speaks here in John chapter 9. As Jesus says to his disciples in earshot, of a man who was born blind. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. There's a a lot of stuff that we could talk about here in John chapter 9, but I just kept coming back to this one sentence and to the thought of being the man, being the man who was born blind. Guys, that would be hard enough today but this was 2,000 years ago. So that means that this was a man who was born without the assistance of Braille, without schools that he could go to, without adaptive equipment. This was a man born into a culture that really did believe. You read longer in chapter nine, the, the religious leaders look at him and they say, you were steeped in sin since your birth, which is their explanation for why his world has been dark. This is a man who was born knowing that the most he could hope for is that his parents wouldn't literally throw him away and he would end up being the tripping hazard in the road as he begged every day. To this man, Jesus says these words. And I think maybe it's worth camping here. I think we've got to wrestle with what Jesus has to say to this man and to us in regard to our suffering. We get to wrestle with it so that we can rest 
in this sentence. And I want to be really clear with you on the front end. There's a lot of different kinds of suffering that human beings experience. There is a lot of different suffering that is described in Scripture. And we're only talking about a specific kind today. Okay? So, for instance, we are not talking about the suffering that comes as a direct result of my sin. There is suffering that comes directly when I sin. Right? Here's an easy one. Get drunk... Right? Scripture doesn't say I can't drink. Scripture says no Christian should ever be drunk. Get drunk at night, wake up with what in the morning? A hangover. None of you know that from personal experience, I'm confident. If I experience that suffering of a hangover in the morning, it's the direct result of my sin, right? There is some sin, or I'm sorry, some suffering in my life. You end up in the GI doctor with the awful, terrible ulcer. Uh, You end up in the counselor's office because your anxiety is through the roof because you have decided that you are bigger and better than God. And God who commands that you take a Sabbath where you connect with him through a worshiping community and you rest and let him be in charge. And you have told God that is impossible. If I take a day off, the whole world will end. So yes, you end up with an ulcer. That suffering is the direct result of sin. We're not talking about that kind of suffering. You see, that kind of suffering has a why. You can look at it and it won't take you long. You might live in denial, but ask everyone around you and they will say to you, oh no, oh no, (laughs) you're suffering because you've gone against, against God's good, perfect, created order. We're also not talking about the suffering that takes place like when the Lord leads you into a wilderness context. You know, those seasons of life where God says, I'm going to kind of strip everything away from you. I'm going to take away the things that you've counted on, the things you've relied on, and I'm going to strip them away and draw you out into the wilderness, just you and me. And a season of life where the Lord is stripping things away, and there is suffering to that. But the point of it is that he wants to draw you closer to him. That suffering also has a why. Right? You can look right at it and say, God has taken these things away because he wants to show me more of who he is. We're not talking about the kind of suffering that, honestly, we don't experience in this country. Uh, Suffering because we're persecuted for our faith in Jesus Christ. That also has a why. We're talking about the kind of suffering like a man born blind. Or Job. If you know the story of of Job, you know, we we are told uh, the whole way through, all 50 chapters of the book, Job didn't sin. Job loses everything. He loses everything. He loses all of his kids He loses all of his wealth. He loses his health. The only thing he's left with is a very nagging wife. And we're told again and again, there's no reason. There isn't a why. That's the kind of suffering we're going to talk about today. And we've got to be able to see this sentence of why it is that Jesus speaks it to us. And we're going to look at this sentence Uh, really by thinking through what I would call the three most common questions that people have in the face of suffering, right? In the face of this kind of suffering. The face of suffering that that we look at and we say, God, I just don't see why we're doing this or why it had to be this bad or why that person. I think most of us (laughs) ask three questions. One is why, or we simply mean, why on earth did this happen? Why this, as in, why was this thing allowed to take place, Lord? And why me? I didn't do anything. We're going to walk through these three questions to help us unpack this sentence. So let's look at the first one. Because the first question is the question the disciples asked. Right? We're told that Jesus is, is walking and he sees the man born blunt. Which means that I suspect Jesus is looking at this man who doesn't even know that Jesus is staring at him. And that Jesus is looking with compassion and with grace Jesus is looking at someone who has suffered a a terrible amount for his entire life, and Jesus knows what's about to come. And while Jesus is looking at this man with compassion, the disciples are looking at this man with disdain and with fear. So they come up to Jesus and they say, Hey, Jesus, who can we blame? Who screwed up? Was it this guy, like apparently in utero, I didn't know that was a thing, or his parents? that caused him to be born blind. Who can we say they did this and that's why suffering is happening in his life? Ever ask that question? We do things like this when we see the homeless person on the street. Or we stand back and we say, I wonder what they did to earn this. 
Or we look at the person who's caught an addiction. Or someone files for bankruptcy. And we stand back and the only question we can say is, well, well why did they get there? What did they do wrong? Because what we're really wanting to know, kind of the, the root to that question, the reason that we're even asking it is we've got this sort of unnamed presupposition, this belief that it can be avoided. Isn't that why we ask the why question? I want to know what you did wrong in your life because if I can figure out what you did wrong, the sin you committed, how you screwed up, then I can avoid suffering in the way that you are. That's their question, guys. They want to know, what did they do? Now, here's the problem with this sort of uh, understanding of our world, that it doesn't match God's view. There is some suffering where sin caused it. There's some things you can look at my world and say, hey, Kelly, what did you do that caused that suffering? But this is not that suffering. See, in the beginning, when God created this world, it was very, very good. In the beginning, when God created this world, friends, there was no suffering of any persuasion. That means things like, in the beginning, there was no infertility and there was no miscarriages. In the beginning, when God created this world the way he designed it, uh, no one got ALS or MS or cancer or any other such thing. In the beginning, no one was born blind or went blind. No one was born deaf or went deaf. In the beginning, you were meant to see and hear and experience the beauty that is God's creation. In the beginning, everything was good. And then Adam. And then Adam looked at God's perfect created order, and he sinned. It's like if you were handed a, a perfect Swiss watch, everything running perfectly, going to run forever, and you just decided, I'm going to take a hammer, and I'm going to bang that thing. And now every cog is out of place. And maybe the watch keeps going, but the time's not right. And, and it doesn't work the way that it was made. That's what Adam did. When he introduced sin, he messed up God's created order. And the truth is, sin infects and impacts. It corrupts, it corrodes everything. That's the reason why there's suffering in this world for which we don't have any other explanation. When the disciples ask Jesus this question, Jesus looks right back at them and he says, nobody, nobody sinned. There's no particular sin that led to this suffering. It's just the fact that there's sin in general that has caused suffering. Could you imagine, see the blind guy was not the deaf guy, okay? Could you imagine being him in that moment and hearing Jesus speak those words? Because odds are really strong. He had thought that his whole life. Right? There had to be some part of him that said, well, what did I do? And why, why did I earn this? Or his parents asking themselves that question. Was it, was it 20 years ago when I sinned in this way? Has God been just storing it up so he could be punitive and punish me and the way he did it was harm my child? Some of us think that way. And some of us genuinely believe I, it's because I'm not enough, or I'm not good enough, or I didn't pray enough, or I didn't trust enough, or I didn't try enough, or I didn't work hard enough, or they didn't do enough. That's why suffering is here. But you've got to hear Jesus' words. He says it wasn't his parents. It wasn't him. There's no particular sin that you can point out. We live in a really broken world, and here's why you can rest in that. It means you're not to blame. Listen, there's, there's some of us in the, in the room today, you need to tune out literally everything else and just hear this. Because some of us have experienced suffering, lived with suffering, are living with it now, and have racked our brains. What did I do? And you get a picture of a savior who is actually just a very punitive, mean God who's been waiting to get you. That's not who Jesus is. That's not who your father is. When we're talking about this kind of suffering, Adam's to blame, but not you. And you've got to wrestle with that and rest in that so you can deal with the next question. See, I suspect that the blind man, who wasn't the deaf man, 
Even when he heard Jesus say it wasn't him and it wasn't his parents, he had to still ask the same question the rest of us ask. Okay, fine. If there is in fact brokenness in this world, if sin corrupts and impacts everything, if I can expect suffering until Jesus comes and finally restores what's been broken, why did it have to be this? Why did it have to be this suffering? And could you just picture the guy being like, Jesus, you could have given me like one busted arm but let me see. I suspect all of us have a, why did you let it be this? And the root under that question is pretty straightforward, right? The reason we ask it is because we look at whatever this is and we say, this is too much. Jesus, this, this was way too much. You shouldn't allow it. This, whatever this is, shouldn't have been permitted to take place. So I need you to think for a second. What's your this? Is your this physical? Is it relational? What's the thing that has happened in your life that caused suffering, uh, past, present, that you look at and say, you could have let it be anything. Why did it have to be this? Is it emotional? Is it circumstantial? Everybody's got it. Paul called it a thorn in the flesh in 1 Corinthians. Right? He, he talks about this thing. He doesn't ever name what it is. He just says, it, it just tore me up. And then he begged God, would you please just take this away? What's your this? Every one of us has it. All of us bring them to the Lord at some point and say, why would you let this happen? Sometimes we look at whatever this is and we say, this is the proof you don't actually care or love, or you're not powerful. Because if you were, you wouldn't have let this be true in me. Or some of us, if we're honest, would say, do whatever you want to me, but why'd you do it to my family member or my friend? And I think we've got to think about a different question. So what Scripture teaches is that why this isn't the right question. I think the right question is why only this? If the first thing's true, sin infects everything. There is nothing in this world that isn't impacted and broken. If the Swiss watch hasn't, uh, there's no part of it that isn't messed up because it got struck with the hammer, then the question is why, is it a, why does it keep going at all? Why is it that so much of my life isn't suffering? Why is it only this piece of life that God has allowed suffering to take place in? See, so what Scripture teaches us is actually pretty incredible and amazing. We serve a Father who is so good and so gracious that rather than allowing every bit of suffering to overtake all of us, He said, no, only this and only this much. Think of Job's story. Job is the only, only time in all of history that we get a glimpse into that single truth. If you know the opening chapters of the book of Job, you know the, the, the narrator tells us that Satan came to the Lord and said, look at Job, I want to utterly destroy him. And God's response is to say, I will allow suffering in Job's life, but only this much. And then you don't get to do any more. You know what that means? I always picture it in my mind when I'm having a why this moment. I picture my God putting his hands over me and sheltering me, and I'm really tiny compared to my God's hands. And all of the things that God has said, no, they don't get in. All the suffering that he doesn't allow through his hands into my life, and the little bit of suffering that he allows to come through had to pass through his hand first. That means he allowed it, and he chose it. That there's an awful lot of suffering I will never experience. But this that is here, listen to what Jesus says. In response to the disciples asking their dumb question, right? Their disciples saying, oh yeah, what happened in his life that he suffered so I can avoid it? Jesus says, this man, parents, didn't sin. But this, this happened so that. We'll talk about the so that in a minute. I want you to just see this clause. 
Jesus says this happened. The father protected, shielded this man, allowed only this suffering into his life so that. You know what that means, right? It means that in the hands of your father, suffering is never senseless. Pain's never pointless. Weeping's never wasted. Ever. My last church, I had a congregant, her name was Dot. By now, Dot's 95. So when I met her, she was in her early 80s. And already at that point, she could only walk a few feet before she needed to sit down because the COPD was so bad. She never smoked a cigarette in her life. Dot had buried her husband decades before from one of the most horrendous forms of cancer to just ruined this man. And she was a nurse and could do nothing. And their youngest daughter, Peggy, was born blind and with the, the cognitive abilities of, say, 18 months, two years. Any time we'd talk on a subject like this, Dot would start to cry. I remember one time preaching this passage and thinking, Jesus, please, anything except this with Dot in the sanctuary, because it just felt mean. I'll own it. And Dot was crying in the back, and after the service, I went, and I wanted to apologize. Like, I am so sorry for preaching this, because it's got to be, it feels too personal. I'm sorry, I shouldn't do that. And she yelled at me. She said, how dare you? You better tell me the gospel. It's because I believe it. And Dot told me that when uh, her daughter was about five, and this was a long time ago, friends, there weren't services there weren't things that were really going to be helpful. As a matter of fact, the doctors had literally told her, just don't feed her because she will have no life. She said, I was reading the Bible and Romans 8.28, which was like Dot's life verse, just jumped out to her. If you know what Romans 8.28 says, and we know that in all things. And if Dot were saying this to you, she would say, all things. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. All things. And she said, you know, when, when my daughter was about five years old, God just hit me with that verse. And she said, I, I looked at my daughter and I said, Lord, I don't... First she went through the why, right? When, she, when her child was born, she said, I went through the why. I tried to figure out what did I do? How is God punishing me? And coming to the realization that we live in a broken suffering world and I said Adam did it I said and then I went through the well, why this why would you let this be what happens to me and my family because you know that has repercussions for a whole family and my daughter and she said I'm not going to understand that I don't I won't I'm going to get to heaven and the Lord is going to un unpack that sentence for me here's what I know he allowed only this there's so much that my daughter gets to enjoy and bring joy to and it's not without purpose. Because I serve a God who would not allow suffering that is wasted. I don't know what your this is. But I know that life changes when I start to rest in the gospel of Jesus Christ, which says suffering in the hands of your father, suffering that he has permitted, is never senseless. Sometimes I get to see it clear as day. There's some suffering that's happened in my life. I can look back on it. I can see, God, you let that happen so that I grew in this way, so that this person got to experience your power. Some of it, I don't know. I'm going to get to glory someday, and the Lord's going to show me. I let this through so that. Let's think about the last one. Because even if we can agree with the Lord for the why, sin impacts everything. The why this, that though I don't understand it, my father didn't let any suffering come into my life that didn't first pass through his hands. And it will have a purpose. He will not waste it. I still sometimes want to know why me or why them. If you haven't had a why me experience in your life, hallelujah. But I bet all of us have had a why them why this person who I love? Why this person who's so young? Why is this person who uh, seems so innocent? Why? Why me? Why them? You know, the, 
the root behind that question is pretty straightforward, right? I or they deserve better. Meaning that the, the thought we have in our minds is, I'm good, I'm a pretty good person. Or, you owe me. I work really hard for you, Lord. I don't deserve this. And we can deal with that pretty quick. I'm not good, and neither are you. Matter of fact, what Scripture says is that after Adam sinned, every single one of us is born in sin. There is not a human being who is good at our core. That's why we need Jesus, right? He didn't come to make good people better. He said dead people, people stuck in our sins, should be made alive and rescued by him. And honestly, I don't deserve better. I have a God who gave me his son, who today has saved me and in eternity will welcome me into his presence. I have the best. I can't argue that I deserve something different. So probably the better statement is why not me? Why shouldn't it be me who suffers this side of glory? Why shouldn't it be me who suffers for this tiny moment that is my lifetime before I spend eternity in the presence of my king? I, I, I don't have a grounds to stand on to say, God, you owe me more. He gave me his son. But here's what's amazing. It is me. It's me that the Lord chooses to use. It's me that God has protected. It's me that he looks at and says, I won't let it be senseless. That's amazing. And when Jesus was talking about that man, he said to him, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. Now, can you just imagine for one second? We've got a man who is blind from birth, <laughs> beggar, uh, everything about him uh, looks like a beggar, and the disciples have been staring at him going, we don't want to be him, and Jesus says, yeah, but it's him that the power and grace and mercy of God will be put on display. Or could you imagine being the beggar and going, I'm sorry, it's going to be who? Who's putting God's power on display? But it was him. It was him that Jesus came and touched. It was him who Jesus recreated Genesis 2 and used clay to make his eyes be able to see. And it is this man who when everybody around him said, what on earth happened? He said, I don't know, but I'm telling you that Jesus did it. It's this man who put the works of God on display. What is amazing, friends, is that if you're in Jesus Christ, the reason your suffering isn't senseless, your weeping isn't wasted, and your pain isn't pointless is because in Jesus, you become the way, the very place where God's power and might is put on display in you in a way that no one else can put him on display. You know, I remember my, my friend Dot, I gotta tell you, when I stood up and said these truths, people went, it's so kind of you to share, preacher. Please sit down and shut up. When Dot, who everybody knew the struggles that she had been through, that she was still going through to try to prepare and provide for her daughter, when everybody knew the fear in Dot's mind and heart of what was going to happen when she was no longer here, but she stood up and said, I'm here to tell you that even in this suffering, my God is good. When she stood up and said, let me tell you all the ways I've seen God provide, all the ways I've seen God move. When she stood up and said, I became a better nurse because I had a child who made me start looking at every one of my patients and say, no matter what condition they were in, they were a bearer of the image of God. And I was going to treat them as such. When she stood up and talked about God's mercy and faithfulness, People listened. And I can't tell you the number of people who came to know Jesus Christ because Dot said to moms who were devastated over the diagnosis their kids just got and said, I've been there and I'll weep with you just like my Savior does and I promise you he won't waste this. There's something amazing about the fact that our God chooses to use us. 
We have to wrestle with these words, friends. Some of us are going to need to wrestle a lot longer than 30 minutes so that we can get to the place where we can rest. As the band's coming forward, I want you to think about these questions. When you look at John chapter 9, who is Jesus? You know, he is not a God who stands way in the distance from us who suffer. He's a God who comes very, very close. But he's also a God who says, you didn't cause this. He's the God who says, I've protected you from so much, and what I have allowed is for my glory. You are the person who the Lord looks at and says, I don't convict you, blame you, I'm never going to condemn you because you're in Christ. You're the one who's been protected by his hands, and you're the very one who can make his kingdom seen, his glory known, even in the face of very real suffering. And so that raises that last question. What's he asking you to do or to be as you come to know who you are and who Jesus is? As we go before the Lord in prayer, he invites you to come before him and ask him, God, what are you asking me to do or to be? And let's pray. Jesus, I don't think we as human beings do a very good job with suffering. We're scared of it, and so we try to run away. We hate it, so we assume you hate us. Give us eyes to see you. To see a Savior who draws near, to see a Savior who looks and who loves. A a God who has said that one day there will be no suffering, and until that day, you protect, allowing only this until that day you allow us to put you on display. Today, Lord, I pray for each one of us in the places where we suffer, in the places where our questions come. May we be like Job. May we be those who come and bring all the questions. Bring them to you, allowing you to speak, knowing that even when often you don't answer the questions, God, you still use, you still move, you're still speaking. That in your hands, the pain always has a point. Thanks for loving us, Jesus. We pray these things in your name. And all God's people said,